In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning. On this edition of the Sunday Sermon broadcast, we'll hear about a notable example from the Old Testament, written for our learning, about a current issue in the church today. The Sunday Sermon features messages from Dr. J. Vernon McGee's 21-year pastorate in downtown Los Angeles, and it's brought to you each weekend by the Through the Bible Radio Network. Naaman, captain of Syria's army, was a great and honorable man but he had one serious problem. He was a leper. And of course, he really wanted to be healed. In his message today from 2 Kings chapter 5, Dr. McGee will tell us about the character, condition, and conduct of Naaman. And we'll learn some important principles about God's ways and methods of healing in Dr. McGee's sermon, Why and When God Heals. Now, before we come to Dr. McGee's sermon, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for insight and understanding of this sensitive issue as we look into your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of the leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when the letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of the leprosy. It came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he'll surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. 
And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, therefore, I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. But he said, As the Lord liveth, before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. And I submit to you that Elisha is one of the most unusual faith healers that's ever appeared on the earth. He wouldn't go up, he wouldn't get by today. He refused the offering and would not accept one penny for what he had done, which uh, indicates to me that he was indeed a man of God. Now our subject this evening is why and when God heals. And tonight I trust that you listen very carefully and I trust sympathetically as we attempt to try to show from the Word of God uh, that we need today a Christian perspective and certainly a biblical outlook on this subject. It's so easy to be carried away today by emotion. It's so easy today to be swept along by popular tide today. And uh, may I say that this evening we trust that this message may be helpful to many. Now, first of all, may I say that I believe in divine healing. So many people, when they hear me uh, make a statement that I have no confidence in divine healers, faith healers, so-called, that they think that I mean that I do not believe in divine healing. I do. There are many instances recorded in the Word of God and I believe not only that back in biblical times God healed, but I believe that God heals today according to his will. May, may I intrude just a little personal testimony to explain what I mean. I would be a very ungrateful person if I did not believe in divine healing. When I was a boy living in southern Oklahoma, I had double pneumonia and typhoid fever all at the same time. And uh, the doctor came one night and he said to my mother, this boy will not live through the night. And there were, as you know in the country in those days, a little town that we lived in, a dear little Methodist lady by the name of Smith, where I went to Sunday school as a boy. Why, she was there. She sat at the foot of the bed and rubbed my feet all night and prayed. And she said, God's going to heal this boy. And she prayed. That night, my mother worked, and the doctor lay down in the country, and the doctor then would come and spend the night, you know, with the patient. He'd lay down on the bed across from mine, and he said, when he dies, why, you call me. But they, they called him, but the boy wasn't dead. And he was amazed the next morning. He said, this is indeed a miracle. I believe it was. I believe in divine healing. But I never knew that dear little Methodist lady by the name of Smith to parade around as a faith healer, and she would never take it a dime for uh, the prayers that she offered that night. In fact, she would have been insulted had she been offered anything. May I say to you tonight, therefore, I believe in faith healing, I believe in divine healing, uh, and I do not think that we do enough of it today of praying for the simple reason we're rebounding against the fanaticism that is abroad in the land. But I want to say again, and I do not mind saying it on radio, I have no confidence today whatsoever in any man who claims to be a faith healer. I do not believe that that is a gift that any man has in this hour. And the thing that is strange to me is, if they want to be put down by Elisha, then let them not become rich today, because most of them have become rich. And that indicates to me that this cannot be of the Lord. Now tonight, we have here one of the most striking and wonderful instances given to us, given to us for the same reason that these that we looked at this morning, to be instructive for us, to teach us something about God's ways and God's methods and God's uh, way of dealing with man, and we see it in this man, Naaman. Tonight I have a very simple outline for you. I want to speak first of all of the character of Naaman, then the condition of Naaman, and then the conduct 
of Naaman. That's a very simple outline, three points, which means it's a fundamental outline, as you can well see. Now, will you notice, first of all, the character of Naaman? There are stated here five outstanding character traits that reveals that this man was no ordinary man. He's one of these remarkable individuals. Will you notice these five outstanding characteristics that are given concerning him? First of all, we are told that he's captain of the host of the king of Syria. Now, when that is stated, it means that he was a five-star general. He was a, a military man of remarkable ability. I would say that he was the General Douglas MacArthur of his day. He was evidently one of the outstanding military men at that particular time, and Israel would bear testimony to that, because he'd been able to move both north and south and east and west with all the freedom in the world because of his sheer ability as a military man. He was the General Douglas MacArthur of that day. He was the captain of the host of the king of Syria. Now will you notice the second thing that is said concerning him. He was a great man with his master. Now that speaks of the high esteem that the king had of him, and also it means that he was a very popular man in Syria. Again, may I say, he was not only the General Douglas MacArthur of his day, he was the General Eisenhower of his day. If he had run for president, he would have been elected because of the fact he was a very popular man. He was an outstanding man of the day. That's the second thing that is said concerning him. The third thing that is said concerning him here is, and he was honorable, honorable. And the word is actually honored. That means that he had a very high position, and he didn't get that position because of the fact that he was a member of the same party that the king was. He merited the position that he occupied. He reminds us, if you please, of Cornelius, the Roman centurion into whose home Simon Peter went to preach the gospel first to the Gentiles. He was indeed that kind of a man, an honorable man, and one honored, if you please, among his people. He was, and we, will you forgive me, but with pardonable pride, I would compare him to General Robert E. Lee, who was an an outstanding Christian, and uh, it is said that one time that after a staff meeting, one of his uh, officers uh, said, uh, are there any ladies present? And uh, one of the other men said, I think not why. He says, I have a story I want to tell you. And General Robert E. Lee looked up. He said, no, there are no ladies present, but they are gentlemen. And this young fellow was withered, and he moved out of the tent. This man, General Robert E. Lee, was an outstanding man of character. May I say to you, that was true of Naaman. He was, though a pagan, he was an outstanding man of character, if you please. Now, that, these are things, my friends, that count. They count today before the world. They count today in the high court of heaven. These are things that are valuable, if you please. Now, the fourth thing that is said, that by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. Now, he was a pagan. He was a pagan through and through. But God had used this pagan. I think that many of us tonight would be amazed how that God sometimes uses pagans. I'm not sure, but what God has used, Mr. Khrushchev, Mr. Stalin to whip America several times to try to bring us to our senses. And, and believe me, friends, we haven't come to our senses yet. We somehow or another think we're going to slip through and continue in our sin, and God's not going to do anything. God used this pagan, and he used this pagan to bring deliverance to Syria, and in so doing, he was able to subdue 
the northern kingdom of Israel that had been under the heel of Ahab and Jezebel. You say, that's strange. It's not strange. God has done that before. God used Cyrus, the Persian, and he called him. That he was his minister. He used Alexander the Great, and you find him recorded in the book of Daniel. And when Alexander the Great came down to take Jerusalem and sack it and destroy it and burn it to the ground, as he had every other city, the priest went out and showed him the book of Daniel, where he was mentioned. He was amazed. Then he came in, and he offered sacrifice in the temple in Jerusalem. May I say to you, God had used him. I believe that God uses men like this, and God had used this man here. Now, that is the fourth thing that is said about him. By him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. Now, the fifth and the last thing that concerns his character, he was a mighty man in valor. Now, may I say that that uh, just sums up the rest. Uh, he, was, he was not only an honorable man, not only a popular man, not only a man of great ability, but he was not a Pentagon general. Uh, his offices were not in the Pentagon, was out yonder on the field. He was a brave man. He was a soldier that knew how to take to the field, and he knew how to get victory, if you please. May I again say... He was the general pattern of his day. He went with his men. He went with his soul. And God, we're told here, records he was a mighty man in valor. He was a courageous man. My friends, these are things that count. These are things that tell us something about this pagan. But may I say to you that, that this man, remarkable, he's unusual, he is uh, not the vegetable variety of a man. He is one of the most remarkable men that move across the page of Scripture. But after you have said these five things concerning him, you haven't told the whole story. That's the character of Naaman. But now will you notice the condition of Naaman? After you've said these five things that really make him a five-star general, we read, but... He was a leper. He was a leper. What a picture. Here is this man, remarkable, outstanding general, but he was a leper. Now, lepers were not excluded from the society in, in he, heathen nations. It was only in Israel. God had made a law that the leper was to move outside the pale of society and be segregated. But uh, we find that uh, among other nations that was not true, and by the way, it's not even true to this good day in many sections of the world. But in Scripture, leprosy is from the very beginning set before us as a type of sin. It's not that it's incurable, because it was curable. So many people feel that leprosy in the Bible is given as an incurable disease. It was not. We have back in Leviticus the way that uh, the man that had had leprosy was to tell whether he had been healed of leprosy or not. Now, God could cure leprosy, and God did. And God pronounced the cure among his own people. Now, this is something, if you please, that can be said tonight of many men. It can be said of many men in high places tonight, they're men of ability, they're men of sagacity, they're men that have done good things, maybe great things. But you always have to add, but he was a leper. Not a physical leper today, but one that has a, a loathsome disease that's known as sin, for leprosy is the type of sin. May I say to you, I do not know about you tonight, you that are listening in and you are here tonight. It may be that there could be written after your name many traits of character in which you excel, but I'm here tonight to say to you that you have to end it all by saying, but he or she is a sinner, 
And you're a sinner because God says that you're a sinner tonight. The Word of God is quite clear on that point. That, that tonight, to, it was Solomon who made the statement, There is no man that doeth good and sinneth not. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that tonight, each one of you, I do not care who you are, it has to be written after your name, but he's a sinner. And when you tell me tonight that I'm an upstanding citizen, I pay my debts, you better today, and uh, I do this and I give to that and I'm the right kind of a person today, may I say, my friend, all of that may be true, but it has to be said that before God tonight, you are a sinner. Do you know that the pagans recognized this a great deal more than we did? It was Seneca, the philosopher. Listen to what he said. We must say of ourselves that we are evil, have been evil, and unhappily, I must add, shall be also in the future. Nobody can deliver himself. Someone must stretch out a hand to lift him up. That was Seneca, a pagan philosopher. And yet there are many people in our contemporary society today, so-called Christian, that do not recognize the fact that before God they are a sinner tonight, lost and undone. He, but he was a leper. He was a leper. What a story, if you please. And so many people today do like this man Naaman did for a long time. He tried to cover up his leprosy. My, he put his five stars up here to cover it up. And he dressed every day so it wouldn't show. Oh, today there's so many ways to whitewash sinners in this, instead of washing them white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, today there's so many ways that men have of trying to cover up. My friend, you can cover up leprosy, but you can't cure it. You don't ever cure it by covering it up. No man has the answer to that. And just to ignore it and say that you don't, well, to say, well, I, I don't think I'm a sinner. I don't feel like a sinner. May I say, you remind me of the man that was talking to the psychiatrist and he said to the psychiatrist, he said, you know, when I come out of my apartment, there's a big lion there that leaps out at me. And the psychiatrist says, you sure do need treatment. And he began to give him treatment. He said, you, sh you should come every day. And he came every day and finally got him to the place. He said, now look, there's really no lion there. There's no lion. Just ignore it. There's no lion there at all. And the man says, I'm beginning to see it. There's no lion there. Now he says, I think you can come twice a week. He started coming twice a week. The man said, you're getting so much better now that you don't even think there's a lion there once a week. And when the appointment came around, he didn't come. And so the psychiatrist called up and his wife answered the phone. She's weeping. And he said, uh, where's so-and-so? He's due to be here today. And she said, haven't you heard? Says he stepped out of the apartment this morning and a lion ate him up. May I say, friend, there are a lot of people today that have been to the psychiatrists of this world and they have been made to believe that they are not sinners, that they do not need a savior, that it's not real. But I tell you, my beloved, it is a reality that you're a sinner. You can cover it up. And there are many ways of covering it up. A lot of people even join the church to cover it up. A lot of people become religious. A lot of people try to do good to cover it up. But my friend, you're still a sinner in God's sight. And so this man Naaman tried to cover it up, but he could not. And then the thing happened was this. There is this little serving maid. And there's a book I've always wanted to write. I've never gotten around to it. Maybe someday I shall. I'd like to write a book on the unknown characters of the Bible. He'd be one of them. That little serving maid that had been taken out of Israel. And my, her witness was a wonderful witness. You know, friends, that today, that uh, Billy Graham says this that always there's been preliminary work done by someone else. These little people today that witness that we never hear about, never see. And I don't think we have many people that get saved in the church of the open door unless somebody's done preliminary work. Somebody's invited them. Maybe you are here tonight 
but you've been invited by someone. May I say to you, those unknown people, this little serving maid, one day in the presence of of Naaman's wife, she says, oh, if my master was only down in Israel, the prophet down there would heal him. And the wife, she picked up her ears and listened, and she said, what is that? Oh, there's a prophet down there. And so she immediately got word to the king, because this general, you see, has the ear of the king also. And the king says, well, if there's a prophet down there that can heal him, we'll send him down in good style. And so they sent him down. Naaman went down, and he took this letter along. And the son of Ahab and Jezebel, Jehoram, was on the throne, and he seemed to have inherited from both his mother and his father. And I want to tell you, when you inherit from either one of them, you'd be bad. But Jehoram had inherited from both of them. He was doubly bad. And a man like that, there are times when his conscience bothers him. And when that letter came to him, he thought, the king of Syria is picking a quarrel with me. Does he think I'm God that I can heal this captain that he sent down here while he's attempting to pick a quarrel? And that word went out. And Naaman's hanging around to see what's going to happen, and word is brought to Elisha. And Elisha sends up word, and I want to tell you it's one of the most wonderful things that you'll find in the Scripture. He says, you send him down to me, and when he goes back, he'll know that there is a prophet in Israel. Oh, if only Los Angeles knew tonight there was a church in Los Angeles. If tonight Southern California only knew there was a church, he'll know, serial now, there is a prophet in Israel. And old Elisha, like Elijah, was true to God. And so they sent this man down. Now we have, and we come to the last, the conduct of Naaman. And I want you to notice this. For this man, Naaman, is probably as proud as any peacock ever was. After all, he's a general, and and a general is always saluted, and everybody waits on him, and he went down expecting some great something to take place. It didn't take place. Will you notice? And this one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid, that is the land of Israel. The king of Syria said, Go to go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. That was quite an offering, wasn't it? That's what Elisha turned down, if you please. He wasn't for sale. He wasn't using this as a religious racket. He says, I want nothing from you at all. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And the poor king doesn't know what to do. It was then that Elisha said, Send him to me. Now Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And He's waiting now for something to happen, something big to happen, if you please. So many people are waiting for that today. So many people in this healing movement, they want something big and spectacular. May I say to you, my Lord, when he healed, in nine cases out of ten, he did it and said, don't say anything about it. Let's not talk about this. He went out of the way. The, yonder at the pool of Bethesda, he went in through the sheep gate, not even the public gate. He did it privately. Nothing spectacular about it at all. And Naaman came. He's a pagan and heathen, and he's expecting some great show and demonstration, certainly a military parade that would look like West Point on parade. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. May I say to you, that is about as rude as any man could be. This prophet wasn't even polite to him. Imagine the general. The five-star general is standing at the door of Elisha. What would you do in the morning if General LeMay stood at your door? Would you do what Elisha did? I think you'd 
call the newspaper up to come out and get a few pictures. I think that you would have all the neighbors in to let them know that the general had come to visit you. When this man came to Elisha's place and knocked on the door, Elisha didn't even go to the door. He went out the back door and he said to his servant, go tell him to dip seven times in the Jordan River. He'll be clean. Now that's no way to do it, is it? I tell you, you're going to need a tent and you're going to need a great deal of falderall. You've got to have the thing worked up emotionally. Not Elisha. Elisha says, you go down and get in the Jordan River. Now, will you notice Naaman? Naaman was wroth. Believe me, he was angry. He went away and he said, behold, now listen to this. This is a pagan view of healing. Behold, I thought he'll surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place. Recover the leprosy. Does that remind you anything? Hitting him? Naaman says, I thought he'd, he'd come out to me. And I thought that we'd have a big crowd. I brought down my retinue. I have my staff here with me. All my servants are here. I thought we'd have something big. And he'd call on the name of his paw. And then he would hit me. And boy, would it be great for TV. Elisha didn't do it that way because God doesn't do it that way, my beloved. When are we going to really follow the Word of God? Now will you notice, this man is hurt, and I want to tell you, he's embarrassed and chagrined. Imagine treating a general like this. He says to the servant, where did the prophet go when he went fishing? And you mean me standing out here for the... Yeah. He's gone fishing. He's already told you what to do. This thing is not going to be spectacular. Now look, listen to Naaman. He can react also. After all, he's a five-star general. Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than, than all the waters of Israel? And you know he was right in that. That little Jordan. I, we, we sing these hymns. It's rather amusing, isn't it? On Jordan's stormy banks I stand. Have you ever seen them pictures of that little miserable little dirty river? May I say to you, it's not a great big river to begin with. Muddy little thing. And, and Naaman says, you think I'm going and dipping that muddy little stream when we've got clear streams up yonder in Syria? And he mentions a couple of them. So he turned and went away in a rage. Believe me, a five-star general has a right to do that. But you know, his servants, those on his staff, following along, they got to thinking about this. They said, now look, the prophet has done a very unusual thing. We, we grant that. Uh, but we don't think we ought to walk out on him. We, we feel that, uh, Naaman, you made a mistake in saying drive on and, and uh, not doing the thing that he said. After all, you're a general. When you give a command, you want it carried out. And when it's carried out, maybe the man that's given the command doesn't know. Maybe he doesn't understand. Did you ever hear of a, of a sergeant that explained to a buck private why he wanted him to do something? I never, I never, they never told it to me that way. They said, do it. And then they did it. And you do it. I mean, you don't ask. You don't say, now let's sit down, Sergeant, and talk this matter over and see which is the best way to do it. He says to him, why don't you obey him? The prophet has said to you to do this thing. And his servants came near, spake unto him, and said, My father, now will you listen, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. You know, if he had said to do something great, I want to tell you that this man Naaman was ready to do it. And, and I believe he could have done something. Why didn't he suggest to him to make an expedition like Jason and the Golden Fleece? Well, why didn't he suggest to him to make a foray like Lancelot against some castle? 
Why didn't he give him an order like a Don Quixote attacking a windmill? Why didn't he say how much money you got there with you? Why didn't he ask him to jump over something or do some great thing? His servant says he hasn't asked you to do anything great. If he had, you would have tried it. He's asked you to do something simple, and you won't do it. He says, I suggest that you try doing what he says. May I say to you tonight, one of the reasons that multitudes in Los Angeles are not saved is because of the fact that God will not let them be saved in their pride and in their fleshly energy. God cannot nor will he save you with your works at all. It's by grace. It is by grace, lest any man should boast. You know, we'd like to say tonight, wouldn't we? We'd like to say tonight, oh boy, I work for my salvation, and am I a smart fellow? I work for my salvation, and I'm a smart fellow, and I'm a little superior to somebody else. My friend, if you get saved, if God heals you of a disease that's worse than leprosy and worse than any other disease known, and that's the disease of sin, you will have to come like Naaman finally came. The five-star general has to lay aside his uniform. The man that is an honorable man can no longer cling to these things. And the man that was a man that had performed brave feats no longer is asked to do anything but to come humbly, come claiming nothing within himself, come looking to Christ. I'm trusting, Lord, in thee, blessed Lamb of Calvary, humbly at thy cross I bow. Jesus, save me now. He doesn't ask you to do something great, my friend. He asks you to come and trust him. That's all. Saturday morning, a week ago, I spoke at the Japanese Makiki Nisi Church in Honolulu. And these brethren here were present. After the breakfast that morning, the pastor asked one of the laymen there, a very fine Japanese man, and by the way, this morning when I said that the pastor was Japanese, I should have said Chinese because we were in the Chinese uh, Christian church the first part of the week, and that was the reference I had this morning. Tonight, though, it is to the Makiki church. And this layman, he uh, uh, took me back to the hotel. And as he did, he said to me, Dr. McGee said, I want to tell you how God healed me. And I said, fine. And then instead of telling me how God healed me, he, uh, healed him, he told about how some man had uh, hit him on the head back out in Honolulu and uh, that uh, he had had sinus trouble and that he'd been healed of his sinus trouble and uh, had not been bothered with it since then. I found out, though, on pinning him down that he was not entirely healed. That's always an interesting thing to me, is that it was not a complete recovery after I pinned him down on that. But I said this to him. I said, uh, uh, and by the way, he told me that three times. He said he wanted to give me that testimony. And I asked him then this question. I said, are you saved? He looked at me, he says, yes. I said, do you know what it is to trust Christ as your Savior? And he said, yes, I do. And I believe he was a genuine, born-again father. Now I said this to him, look. I said, all the people that Jesus healed are dead today. All that he saved are alive today and are with him. Which is it best, to have your body healed or have your soul saved? Well, he says, when you put it like that, it's better to have your soul saved. Now, I said, look, you've given me a testimony three times that your sinus was healed. I said, in 50 years, you and I, either one, will never be in Honolulu. But it's going to make a lot of difference whether you and I trusted Christ as our Savior or not. That is the thing that is all important. 
Instead of telling me three times you've been healed of sinus, why didn't you one time tell me that the Lord Jesus had saved your soul? I had to pull that out of you. Tonight, my friend, God heals. But he heals his way, not your way. He's sovereign in this. Sometimes it's his will to raise a person up. Sometimes it's will not to raise a person up. Peter is delivered out of prison, but James is put to death. Both of them according to God's will. God's will is supreme. If you think God is any man's messenger boy, tonight you are dead wrong. If you think any man on this earth can command God to do anything, God is the five-star general tonight. Naaman is no longer a five-star general. And there's no man tonight a five-star general, but God is. He's sovereign, and everything must be according to his will. But the important thing, the important thing is here that this man Naaman went back healed of his leprosy, but also a man that was giving a testimony that the God in Israel was the true God. May I say to you tonight, the important thing is, is for God to save your soul. And tonight I do not know what good things can be said about you, and I'm sure there can be good things said about you. But you are a leper. You're a sinner. You need a Savior. And he tonight is the only one that can heal the leprosy of sin. He alone tonight can take a sinner and save him. Oh, my friend, that's the important thing. And in these days when men are seeking something, why not come to him? Why not do business with him? And as we said this morning, come in contact with the living Christ. That's the important thing. I'm wondering if you are here this evening, friend, and this splendid congregation indicates that some have come here tonight, maybe for curiosity's sake, to see what this preacher in downtown Los Angeles is going to say about healing. I believe in faith healing, but I think the most important thing is to have your soul saved by coming to Jesus Christ. That's all important. That's all important. After all, even those that Jesus healed, that man at the pool of Bethesda, that man let down through the roof, that leper that came to him, they all died. They all died. But those that had their sins forgiven are with him tonight. That's important. That's important. You know, it's so easy to get our eyes fixed on the physical world and disregard the spiritual because we can't see it. But what value is physical healing if you lose your eternal soul? So if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin and judgment, we hope that you'll trust him today while you have the opportunity. We have a very helpful packet of material available for you, including a leaflet that Dr. McGee called The Inside Story which has many scriptures explaining God's way of salvation. So would you write to us at Sunday Sermon in the U.S. Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Or give us a call anytime at 1-800-65-BIBLE and ask for the salvation packet. That number again is 1-800-652-4253. And we hope that all of you will write and let us know if you're being blessed by the Sunday Sermon. Your earnest prayers and faithful support are a vital part of this worldwide Bible teaching ministry, and we're thankful for those of you who are helping us take the whole word to the whole world by radio. Now until next week at the same time, may the Lord's grace, mercy, and peace be with you every moment of every day. Jesus made it home, home to be my This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of Through the Bible Radio Network.